Hi everyone, Nicole Lippman from Aurelian Coaching. So thanks for joining this week. This week we are going to be talking about mid-year performance reviews. Now, the reason I chose this time of year to talk about this is because every company has a different calendar for these types of things. And I wanted to provide some insight early enough in the year that I would catch a lot of your calendars around mid-year performance reviews. And so you guys don't miss the boat. Now, if you guys won't be having mid-year performance reviews for another couple of months, that's totally fine too. Just go ahead and bookmark this and you'll need to come back to it later because I think that there is such a very uh, important and straightforward way of addressing mid-year reviews that is just going to be super efficient and super productive for you guys. Now, I'm not interested in performance reviews where everything is just going fantastically well. <laughs> if that's the case, congratulations. I'm so happy for you. This is for folks either for yourself or if you're managing other people and you have direct reports and people are not progressing toward their annual goals as well as you want them to or as well as you would have hoped. And so there needs to be some diagnosis, there needs to be some planning put in place to get people back on track. And so that's what this is about today. So I have done literally hundreds of, of reviews. <laughs> I've just done them for so many people over the years. I've certainly had my fair share of performance reviews. I love that feedback. And I've done 360 reviews, right? So I have provided feedback up to my boss, up to all of my managers, up to company leadership. So it can be a crazy process, right? I don't know if you guys have, have this, but there's usually review season, right? So there's all this paperwork and there are all these meetings and it's just crazy. And for a lot of you, if this was a, if it was a similar experience to what I had, is that a lot of these things happen at the tail end of the calendar year right? So you're setting goals for the following year. So you've got the holidays and it's just madness. So it's really important mid-year to do a check. And what I'm hoping is that unlike the craziness of the annual review process toward the end of the year, um, that in the mid year review, we are able to be a little bit more thoughtful, a little bit more mindful um, to set ourselves up for success through the rest of the year. And here is how to do it. Of all the issues that have come up over so many years of doing performance reviews, all the issues I feel basically boil down to two categories of challenges, just two, <laughs> okay? And I am super curious if you can come up with a challenge that you've dealt with in a performance review that wouldn't fall into one of these two categories. So I'm gonna talk about those two categories, and then I'm gonna talk about the strategies to address those challenges, and they are very straightforward. Okay, so the first category is that progress toward goals are not happening because the employee feels not that connected to the annual goals that were developed in the first place. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, if the employee doesn't feel so connected, it's probably because of one of two reasons, and it has to do with the shortcoming of how the goals were developed in the first place. So number one, those annual goals need to be important, and I'm going to define that in a minute. Secondly, they need to feel relevant. So here's what I mean by those two terms. Important means that what you're having that employee do through the rest of the year 
is clearly connected to a larger initiative that either that department or that company, the entire organization is trying to accomplish, okay? It not only is connected, but the employee themselves can articulate that direct connection. It is so important, okay? Secondly, is that it needs to feel relevant, right? And what I mean by that is not just that if the employee does this thing, the company or the department gets closer to their goals, but that the employee is also getting something out of it, right? They feel like if I do this thing, it's relevant for me. It's relevant for my career. It's relevant for my skill development, my professional development, right? So if the diagnosis on why goals have not progressed mid-year as much as you would have liked them to, I would look at whether the employee really feels connected to those goals and have a frank conversation, if you can, about whether the employee feels, is that important? Do you feel that if you do this thing, you are supporting a larger initiative? And number two, do you feel like you're going to get something out of this, right? And it's that frank conversation that I think gets you to the other side and get you guys on a pathway to actually setting up the rest of the year for success. Now, there may be another reason that the employee does not feel so connected to their annual goals, and that is that things changed. Now, I came up the ranks in government, really large organizations. I also came up the ranks in small business. So, Things change a lot, but here's where you need to be very careful. You've got to be sure that the change actually justifies the adjustment in an annual goal, okay? What I find has happened in the past, this has been my own experience, and you guys can let me know what you think, is that circumstances or conditions on the job change and the employee makes assumptions. <laughs> Sometimes the manager makes assumptions, right? The example that I used in my blog this week had to do with a member of the team leaving the company. And so what happens is now there's a vacuum in the performance of duties and responsibilities that that person used to fulfill. And they're isn't a really good conversation about what happens to all that, all those person's uh, follow-up items and all the customers that they have. There's no explicit conversation. What happens is that people are generally <laughs> good and they want to help out, and so they jump in to fill in the gaps. Completely makes sense, right? Here's the thing. If there's no conversation about how that impacts your annual goals, I wouldn't operate under the assumption that leadership and management is just going to reward you for stepping up, right? That conversation is so important, right? And it doesn't have to be a big deal at all. It could be as simple as hey, with so-and-so being out, there's, there's all this other stuff. It might take, I don't know, six weeks, eight weeks to advertise, recruit, onboard, and train somebody new. So in the meantime, that's going to be a couple of months where I'm not focused on my goals. Can we talk about what that means? And you don't have to do it on the spot. You could just say, you know, I want to circle back with you on that at some point, right? So it's really important for the employee and the manager to be on the same page about how the conditions actually impact the completion of your annual goals. Are you guys jointly deciding, you know what, we have to back burner those, and instead I'm going to be measuring your performance on X, right? That needs to be explicit versus, oh, no, 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 I don't need you to do all of this stuff because Jane left, right? Please, please focus on your goals and let me worry about backfilling Jane's duties and responsibilities.
it's that conversation needs to happen because what I've seen is that people step in and they come to annual review time and they look at their goals and they're sort of like, well, I didn't complete any of this stuff. And, you know, Jane left. So I was picking up the slack and what do you mean you weren't going to reward me for not making my goals this year? Right. You don't want to have that awkward conversation. Okay. So to review, if the diagnosis of the shortcomings in the annual reviews is because the employee doesn't really feel connected, it could either be because the goals are not set up um, and framed in the sense that they're, it's, they're clearly important to the department or the organization and they're clearly relevant to what the employee is trying to accomplish. And if six circumstances have changed, that it's really clear what, how that impacts what the individual employee is expected to do as part of their annual goals, okay? So that was the first category. The second category is that the annual, there's agreement that the annual goals are super important, that's clear, hey, they're really relevant. If I do this, I am going to get so much benefit. And yet, the employee is just not focused on those goals, right? Weeks pass, months pass, and you kind of look at the goals and you're like, oh, oh yeah, I forgot, I was supposed to do that thing. What this is, is people getting caught in the whirlwind of day-to-day, -day, emails, calls, you're fulfilling your duties and responsibilities as outlined in your job description, no question, you are performing well, right? But you're not tackling those, those stretch goals that were developed um, in order to kind of push the envelope and gain something new. Maybe it's knowledge, skills, exposure to new things, right? Or you're not supporting the overarching company initiatives where the company is trying to push the envelope on something. So what's happening there? Okay, if that's the diagnosis where the employee just can't be focused, what I found over the years is that it's usually because of one of two types of bias, okay? So either the employee is suffering from a discounting bias, and I'll tell you what that is, or there's something called the planning fallacy. Okay, as soon as I describe these things, you guys are gonna be like, oh, that's me. <laughs> I've seen that before. Okay, so here's what the, the discounting uh, bias is. And that is operating under the assumption that you that what is happening in the moment is so much more important or urgent and that it takes precedence over the longer t longer term goals or, or objectives okay now sometimes that's actually the case like sometimes i get it you got to put out fires and you're you're making a conscious decision that I'm going to be putting off some of these longer term things, right? That's fine. What discounting bias is, is it's not so mindful. Discounting bias says that you're just caught in the whirlwind and you're doing everything right in front of you at the expense of longer term gains, right? So the way I like to think of discounting bias is if you didn't complete that annual goal, is your future self going to hate you for it? <laughs> Are you going to kick yourself in the future for not just buckling down and paying attention to some of the longer term initiatives, right? We all get sucked in. I get it. We all get sucked in. So if that's the case, and if the diagnosis is there's probably some discounting bias going on here, what I have found, I have a little trick that I've used with my direct reports that I've certainly used with myself, and I've, I've seen other people make this recommendation, which is that you, you've got to translate abstract downstream benefit to something tangible today, right? So for example, 
if you meet those goals, you'll get some money, right? You'll get a bonus, right? But you know what? It's not like the money's in your pocket today, right? So it's really hard to feel the loss of that money if you don't feel like you already had it and it was it was something that you lost downstream, right? So a lot of times what I've encouraged people to do is translate that abstract downstream benefit to something that is tangible right now. So people always talk about vacations. If you are going to get a bonus and you want to take a beach vacation with that money, if you were to get that money, guess what? Go ahead and plan for it. Start looking where would you go, right? Maybe it's not as complicated as a beach vacation. Maybe it's just a weekend getaway. Maybe it's paying off debt, right? Translate that downstream benefit to something that you can actually plan for today. It's a huge motivator. It makes things so much more tangible. Okay, the other bias that might come into play if uh, the employee is just not very focused on their goals day in and day out is something called the planning fallacy. And you guys are gonna recognize this because I just feel like this is human nature. Okay, so what the planning fallacy says is that people underestimate how long it takes to do something, right? And if the end of the road, if the deadline is really far out, a lot of people think, I've got plenty of time to complete it, right? And even, and I've seen, it's really interesting. I've done mid-year reviews where people have not taken a step, a single step toward their annual goal, and they are so not concerned. <laughs> They're like, oh, yeah, you know, I got, I got six months. I got six months to do this. Guys. <laughs> you are gonna find yourself between a rock and a hard place and then you're gonna be kicking yourself for not making your bonus or not getting that promotion or whatever, right? So if you are finding yourself in this planning fallacy, there are a couple of things that you can do. Number one is after people make their annual goals, a lot of times what happens is they just stop. <laughs> They just stop. They're like, fantastic. I submitted the paperwork. I'm done. Woo! I'm going to go to a Christmas party. And then what happens is they don't ever sit down and put together a plan, a plan, you know, to actually execute on that goal throughout the course of the entire year. This is a good idea, right? So you got to make a plan, right? But here's the thing. A plan in and of itself is not enough. It's not enough. Because here's what I find a lot of people doing. They create plans in silos. Oh, I have a goal. I can put together a plan. Look at my plan there. Oh, here's another goal. I can put together another plan. Oh, and here's number three. Here's a plan. Look at my plans. Beautiful, right? Except that they have no bearing on one another. The reality, the reality is that you are going to have the competing priorities. There are limitations on the resources that are available to you. The number one being time. Time. Those three annual goals sound so fantastic. They're important. They're relevant to you. You're so excited to do them and you've created these plans but you've still got all this other stuff to do, right? So it's really important when you put a plan together that it is informed on all of the limitations and restrictions on available resources. And that could, it's not just time. Remember, it's not just time. If these are really good annual goals, they're stretch goals, which means they're pushing the envelope. It's, it's not something that you can snap with. You have to spend time thinking about, well, I don't know how to do that thing. How do I 
get the skills, get the knowledge to do that thing. Guys, that's got to be in your plan, right? And if you have a plan that's just, well, you know, here's and I'm stacking things up, but is really not informed on all the other things that you've got going on, you're setting yourself up to fail, right? So plan validity. Do not assume that you've got all the time in the world and you'll tackle it later. Always put together a plan. And if you haven't put together a plan by that mid-year performance review, guess what? You can do it now. Go ahead and plan the rest of the year, okay? And make sure that that plan is informed on everything else that you've got going on. Okay? Just because you get a new set of annual goals doesn't mean that all the stuff that you did last year just magically goes away. That's still there, okay? So be super informed and realistic about what you can accomplish and work with your manager on it or if you're a manager work with your direct reports on this tell them I want to see what your plan is like and let's talk about you know what are the challenges in actually executing on that timeline and if we can identify the challenges great okay now how are we going to address those challenges this is laddering it's a it's a way of tackling these challenges and these issues in incremental ways, right? So that you're just not leaving it up to the employee to just go go figure it out. <laughs> go figure it out. If you're a manager, okay, you have a responsibility to help them. Not do it for them, but you gotta help them. Okay, so that was my grand assessment for uh, mid-year reviews. Now, toward the end of the year, I am going to have a different set of blog posts and and videos on how to do an annual review well and how to set up goals for the next year but this was just you know checking in mid-year okay so i hope you guys found it helpful um if you are part of a really in skill masters you're going to get this summary tomorrow via email you'll get some tools you guys all know about that if you uh want to sign up for skill masters you can do so at AureliaNCoaching.com, it's free. Um, at the top bar, you can uh, fill out your information, and then we'll just slot you right in. Okay, so next week, what I want to talk about, because <clears throat> I know a lot of people, if you are a first-line manager or mid-career manager, you are responsible for identifying people, recruiting people, and interviewing people, and hiring people. Now, you might not be the sole decision maker, right? You may have an HR department that you're partnering with, or you might be doing this with your management and other people in leadership. That's all fine. But usually, if you are a manager, you are ultimately responsible for replacing people on your team or for adding people to your team if you need to. And I want to talk about how to do that. And um, there's a lot written out there <laughs> on this stuff, but I think that there are a couple of things that people should be paying attention to that they are so not paying attention to. So tune in next week for that. The final thing I want to mention is I actually had a separate blog post this week, a little extra for email communication. And this is making its way um, through Facebook. I've seen it like shared quite a bit. I usually don't get into the weeds, the technical weeds on some, some of these things, but, but this was a request from uh, a good friend of mine who said, can you please tell people how to use email communication? As I said, okay, so I did it. And uh, the bottom line is that email is not communication, guys. It's not. So go ahead. That's a little extra this week. Go to AureliaNCoaching.com. You can find that blog post as well. And uh, that's it. So I hope you guys have a great rest of the week and weekend. And I will see you guys here next week, same time, same place. Take care.